that's a perfect time for um, us to get started. Uh, my name is uh, Jerry Simons. I'm a PA on the South Fork of Long Island. I'm one of the original medical advisors for the Stony Brook Southampton Regional Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center. It's a big name, but we do a lot of stuff. Um, I'm also an assistant clinical professor at Stony Brook University, and I've been doing things with Lyme for a long time. Um, I was the 2010 um, winner of the Tick-Borne Disease Alliance uh, National Award, and I've been a medical advisor for different Lyme and tick-related groups, and two, including uh, Turn the Corner and the Lyme Times Magazine. I've written um, articles for them. So on behalf of Eastern Long Island Hospital and Stony Brook, I definitely want to welcome you to the this exciting hour. So at uh, Stony Brook Southampton, we spent the year with COVID um, publishing an amazing tick-borne disease um, reference handbook, which can be sent to you by email as, as a PDF. And we have regular paper copies as well. And I think that we're really famous for our year-long tick hotline, which is staffed by our Lyme disease nurse, Rebecca. We're gonna have her uh, introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what she does with this very important phone number. Yes, hello everybody, Rebecca Young. Here. I am the patient navigator of the Regional Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center, and that is basically a tick hotline, and uh, I can get as many as 800 people calling a summer, so it's, it's quite, we have quite a bit of business. The calls can be anything from, I have a tick on me, what do I do, to somebody that says, I've been sick for 10 years, I've been on IV medication, I've seen every specialist and I'm still sick, now what do I do? And I, I've been doing it about six years. The questions are getting more sophisticated in terms of breaking down what the tests are and the antibodies, PCR. Uh, but generally people uh, are sick and they just wanna know what to do and they go to five different doctors and they are told five different things. So we try to pull all the information together. I'm sent to different um, seminars and I talk to lots of doctors and I try to get a handle on what is going out on out there with tick disease and um, increase everybody's knowledge base so they can be their own advocate. I love it, it sounds great. And also here on the call, we have uh, Karen Wolfrat, who's basically the glue that keeps the tick center together. Her email is here. If you want a copy of uh, this free book as a PDF or mail to you, this is an email that you wanna either write down or take a picture of with your phone. And probably gonna be questions out there. So um, between Rebecca and I, we'll conquer the questions at the end. There's a little chat button. So just type into the chat your questions and we'll get through them either at the middle or at the end. And we're gonna talk for about a, uh, hour or so. So not to put anybody on the spot out there, but we're going to start with a little pop quiz, true or false, and we're going to give you the answers at the end. So number one, ticks can only make you sick if they're attached for more than 24 hours, true or false. Number two, Lyme is the only serious tick illness, true or false. Alpha-gal meat allergy, there's a lot of it on the North Fork, can be deadly, true or false. Everyone with Lyme remembers a tick bite, true or false. The CDC says a positive Lyme test is required to diagnose Lyme, true or false. A tick can give you more than one illness at a time, true or false. A summer flu could be a tick illness, true or false. I'll give you a hint, that's true, Rebecca was just on uh, CBS Channel 2, I believe, she was interviewed all about that. You could only get a tick bite in warm weather, true or false. And 90% or most people who get Lyme get over it easily, true or false. So a couple of key points. Lyme disease is on the rise. There's a combination of reasons, 
you know, are there, are you seeing more deer when you drive around town? The weather is warmer, uh, the suburbs are expanding as well. But we also know that um, tick disease is, I think Karen has to mute herself for now. Great. Um, tick disease is preventable. Absolutely. And also remember that, um, you know, everybody out there, we just like to use common sense. Okay. Yeah, I like Karen's ringtone, though. Maybe I'll hit mute on Zoom. So um, these are our key points, right? Everything you could think of. Um, avoiding brush, right? Avoiding the world, trails, everything like that. Rebecca, maybe you could call Karen and help her out. Thank you very much. So, um, again, here are our key points, right? I think most of you on this list are probably seeing more deer. And I personally am a big fan of the four poster system, which is done at certain you know, parks and trails. And it actually treats the neck of the deer, helps to reduce tick population. Uh, you want to make sure you get rid of mice and birds from your yard and always use two layers of protection. Put a protect uh, a repellent on your skin and a repellent on your clothing. We'll talk about prevention when we get to the end. It also is important to remove a tick as soon as you find it. Label the tick and save it. Remember that certain diseases like Powassan virus and problems like alpha-gal have a very fast transmission time. And as we already kind of told you that the summer flu could be COVID, right? We're checking everybody with a flu for COVID or could be also related to a tick disease. We'll get to the prevention stuff at the end, but remember we don't like to use a lighter or hot oil um, to get rid of the tick. It could just piss the tick off and make it push the germs into you. But after you've been outside, we do like for you to put your clothes in the dryer. That's gonna kill the ticks. And then later on, wash them like you normally would. So these are some of our key points. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about the Lyme infection in particular, Lyme in the news. We're gonna talk about some other kinds of infection, the type of ticks, probably some of you are finding ticks out there already the diagnosis and treatment, how we know what you've got, prevention. And there are so many ticks out there. Everybody's talking about getting tick bites. So are we actually in a tick NATO that there's so many ticks? Here's a great picture of our um, complimentary uh, tick removal kit, which includes our world famous tiny little forcep really fine tip tweezer, which we think is the best way to get um, ticks off of you if you do get a tick bite. Just a quick disclaimer, um, talking about Lyme and ticks can be controversial. And like Rebecca said at the beginning, there are lots of different opinions, but you'll see that most of my slides have some kind of reference um, behind it. So, most Lyme disease cases are reported in the warmer months, June, July, August, for example. But tick disease is a year-round problem, right? We find people raking their, law, their lawn in November, removing a leaf pile, and there are ticks under there. And many tick diseases have an incubation period. Remember, incubation period, when you get exposed to the germ, how long it takes for you to get sick. I thought this chart from the CDC was very interesting. Look at this, the month of disease onset from 2018 to 2019. So there are still people developing tick-related symptoms deep through the winter. But right now, everybody, June, July, this is peak battle season. We're in emergency mode fighting tick bites. Now, because of 
warmer weather, climate change, urban sprawl, destruction of forest, whatever you want to think of, people moving around, there has been a geographic spread of Lyme disease. Look at the spread of Lyme disease way back in 2001, right? A little on the West Coast, a little in Texas, a lot where we are. Take a look at that. And now um, looking um, over to um, 2019, right? So we have 2001 and then look 10 years later, 2011, right? More in Florida, more, you know, north of Chicago, going through to um, Minnesota, the Dakotas. And now people look at this, 2019, right? So at least where we are, there's more of a spread, right? Going up and down. I know, I know people, we're trying to work on Massachusetts to actually report their data. Because people are like, Jerry, I want to move to Massachusetts. I don't see any line there. There actually is a lot. They're just not reporting it um, the way that we should. So it is spreading. Look at this uh, published uh, report out of both Oregon and New York um, from different ecology departments from ba Bard and Oregon State University. And they found that the black-legged ticks, the deer tick, people, those are the ones we don't like, that there are more nymphal teen, t, uh, the teenage ticks, and more babies coming faster and living longer, right? Um, with the spread with global warming, the environment. So we're seeing more and more ticks spreading. Look at this from Canada, right? This Canadian study, Journal of Applied Ecology, back in 2012, found that ticks are moving northerly about four kilometers deeper every year into Canada, mainly because of temperature change. There are doctors and PAs and nurses in Canada seeing Lyme disease where it didn't exist in their towns years ago. So this problem is spreading. Rebecca and I, when we have nothing to do on a Friday night, we go to our favorite website called tickencounter.org, which is really, it's got everything. Types of ticks and where they live, what germs they carry, where to have them tested. Um, and they actually have a big reminder on their website, as does the CDC, that ticks are really active all year round, unless it's really freezing weather. So be careful about ticks all year round. Here's a tick, it looks like it just ate and it's crawling right out of the ice, probably looking for you. Gary? Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to say that in the six years that I've been working uh, for the hospital, uh, I, I say maybe in the last two years, I'm getting lots of calls from Canada and lots of calls from Maine. And in the first couple of years, I never got a call from that far north. Wow. I'm also getting them more west. I have a lot from Arkansas coming in right now and a lot on the coast of Florida. Wow. Amazing. So it's true, right? So Welcome to Zoo. Why? Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Up, oh, Karen, you're already in the meeting. Um. So again, right, Rebecca was saying, right, think about this, right? Um, you entered 87. This meeting ID does not uh, exist. Ticks. Please re-enter your meeting ID. So uh, right now, ticks in Maine are literally attacking the moose, right? You could easily find um, 10 or 20,000 ticks on one moose, right? This is what a lot of moose in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire are looking like right now, and they really shouldn't be looking like that. Look at this quote. The moose are literally being drained of their blood. It's about as disgusting as it gets. And baby ticks are actually killing about 70% of moose calves across Maine and New Hampshire. I always like to tell the story. Um, when I was in college, we walked around with signs saying, save the whales, save the whales. But really, we should now be saying, save the moose, save the moose. 
Now, Lyme disease is basically all over the news. If anybody went on their social media today, they probably saw, you know, this morning, Alec Baldwin coming out today, June 9th at 1250, talking about his bat, his 20 year battle with Lyme disease symptoms, right? Look at that. He said, having Lyme disease, like someone snapped their fingers and put a spell on me. We know that according to Newsday, tick-borne disease is really at epidemic levels right now. And Justin Bieber, right? Uh, two years ago, people were saying that, oh, Justin Bieber is doing drugs. He looks terrible. You know, he's not washing, shaving. He looks like a wreck. But it actually wasn't a drug problem. Justin Bieber came out last year with the fact that he was battling Lyme disease. And as he got that treated, he started looking better and better. And a very famous story about five years ago, the famous singer, Chris Christopherson, who was basically put in a nursing home, a care center, because of Alzheimer's memory loss. He couldn't operate a fork. He couldn't get his own shirt on. Um, looking at his history, the wife was like, well, someone please give my husband, Chris Christopherson, doxycycline. And they gave him doxycycline, his memory, his coordination, his mood improved. Now, again, these are some exceptions to the general rule of Lyme. But again, the story about Lyme and the effect of Lyme is definitely out there in the news, right? Ali Hilfiger and the Beverly Housewives, Yolanda Hadid, all are putting their story out there. So what I really think is important is everybody listening still, listen to this. If you're in Greenport or South Hold or Connecticut or Southampton or Montana and you get a tick on you and you get a rash or you get a tick on you and you start feeling like you've got the flu, if we give you the correct treatment, for example, Lyme disease, that is generally going to be treated and you're not going to have any long-term problems for about 90% of the world. So my opinion, if you catch Lyme disease early enough and treat it, you're going to get over it. Now, there's about a 10% failure rate, right? About 10% of people who get Lyme aren't going to get over it, right? right away. And these are the Chris Christopherson, Ali Hilfiger, those different types of things. But think about this, from Greenport to Montauk, if about 100 people in a summer weekend get Lyme disease, 90% of people are going to get over it, and 10 people are going to be left with some of these long-term problems, right? Even Stanford University, they're pretty smart there. Stanford published a few years ago that for 10 to 20% of patients, the disease persists, causing joint pain, neurologic defects, and fatigue, right? So this is part of the controversy. Once you're treated for Lyme disease and you still have symptoms, headache, joint pain, fatigue, whatever you want to come up with. Is it the actual disease persisting or is it residual symptoms and autoimmunity? People, that's a hot scientific debate right now. And that's another Zoom lecture altogether. But you know what Stanford is saying is that in this small percentage, they could have persistent disease, which is what I've been saying for a long time. 90% get over it, 10% may have long-term symptoms. So what do we need all of you to know? Why are we at Eastern Long Island and Southampton doing this today? Number one, we want you to know how to prevent tick bites. Number two, we want you to know that boys, especially age five to 10, are the highest risk for Lyme. They're out there generally not using repellent, rolling around in the grass, things like that. Number three, if you have a summer flu and you're in an endemic area, like those blue dots we saw on the CDC map, think about Lyme disease. Naturally, we're checking for COVID and flu, but we keep Lyme disease 
in our memory. Also very important, a blood test is not accurate early on, right? If you get joint pain and the flu and you've been sick for a few days, we may never find that in your blood, as well as a rash. If you've got the red ring rash, we'll probably never find the Lyme disease marker in your blood. Also know that ticks carry more than just Lyme. They can carry parasites like Babesia. They can carry viruses like Powassan. They can carry protein problems and allergy problems like Alpha-Gal. And it's very important to do regular tick checks when you're out and about on your normal activities. Sometimes interesting story, little kids who get Lyme disease may not get joint pain in the flu. They may have a behavior change or a sudden drop in their grades. And again, in my hot-headed opinion, I've found that it's better to treat early because of this, mainly with this problem that it takes time to show up in the blood. If it's July 4th and somebody comes to me with a summer flu, and their COVID swab is negative, and they're a landscaper, gardener, they've been outside, I'm more likely to say, take doxycycline until we figure this flu thing out. So we've been talking about Lyme, but what is Lyme exactly, right? Well, Lyme disease is a bacteria. It's this little corkscrew-shaped bacteria that likes to drill into cartilage and all over the body. So the Lyme disease bacteria can make people and pet sick, pets sick. And I need you to remember that there are a lot of variations of the germ. So there are lots of different presentations. One person with Lyme disease may just have a headache. Another person with Lyme disease may just have joint pain. Some could have both, right? Also, please, Karen and uh, um, Rebecca and I have enough gray hair already. Don't say limes, it's just lime without an S, okay? So very interesting. If you remember, Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria and it can be caused by several different kinds of bacteria. Now, the Mayo Clinic and several other institutions have reported that there are four strains of Lyme disease. Borrelia burgdorferi, Mayoni, Avzeli, and Garnini, and having any one of those germs could cause Lyme. The CDC is still saying specifically Borrelia burgdorferi. So we've been trying to get Lyme uh, to get the CDC to update their definition. But what do you guys all need to remember? Lyme can be caused by more than one kind of germ. Now, Dr. Benjamin Luft from Stony Brook, who's in our uh, tick team at the Resource Center, a few years ago published this article. And I really think this is my favorite definition of Lyme. Lyme disease is a multi-systemic tick-borne infection, meaning that it affects more than one system caused by the slowly dividing spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi. This is one of the reasons why when you're treated for Lyme disease, you're taking medicine for three or four weeks because it takes that long to kill the germ. If you have a strep throat, five days of medicine will usually do the trick. So Lyme is multi-system. So if someone comes to me and they're saying, oh, I have a terrible headache, I think it's my Lyme. It's probably not that or my elbow is hurting. I'm like, well, it's probably not Lyme. But if they have more than one system involved, like, oh, Jerry, I have a headache and fatigue, or I have joint pain and a headache, it's affecting more than one system. That is making me think Lyme. Look at this. The organism is able to evade host immunity. Now, most blood work looks for your immune response, but the Lyme germ likes to hide from the immune system. And sometimes I will make it hard to pick up in the blood test. This is one of the reasons why the CDC does not require a positive test. And it can persist as a latent infection only 
to come back, giving rise to chronic disease. You're like, wow, it sounds like what the guy at Stanford was saying. So again, please remember 90% of people get over Lyme, they take the medicine, they're done with it. But this article, the Stanford article, you know, Alec Baldwin, Justin Bieber are more talking about this 10 percenter, right? The exception to this definition is if you've got the red rash, then you definitely got Lyme. So when someone says they've get been bitten by a tick, you know, I kind of say that, wow, you've been bitten by a dirty, you've been stuck by a dirty needle. Think about it. Ticks live in nature, in the dirt. They drink blood from a, a wide variety of different animals, birds, raccoons, deer, moose, rodents, and then even you, right? So when you get a tick bite, it's like being poked with a dirty needle. So what do ticks look like? I'm sure everybody on this uh, meeting has seen ticks maybe even seen ticks on you, right? But what I need you to remember is that the baby, baby ticks that are almost clear, we call those larvae, have six legs, three on each side. Nymphs, which are the teenagers and adults, have eight legs. The good news that I need you all to know on this Wednesday afternoon in June is that most larvae really don't have infection. So if someone says, Jerry, I got bit by a tick, and they email the office a picture or they describe it, they're like, yeah, it has three legs on each side and it's almost clear. I'm like, okay, sounds like a larval tick bite. I don't think you need to take a preventative, you know, just keep an eye on the area, right? So luckily larvae don't really carry infection. Now, there are many different kinds of ticks, and we're going to see them, especially in June, at different stages of growth. Baby, teenager, and adult. Larval, nymph, and adult. Right now, in June, we are really in deer tick season, and we're seeing some lone star, and we're also seeing some good old fashioned wood ticks out there, right? The rickettsial wood ticks. Also, some people are talking about the regular brown dog tick and the new visitor in town called the Asian longhorn tick. So these are some of the different ticks that are out there. One of my other favorite pieces of advice is the next time you're at the store, pick up a lint roller. And when you're outside, especially along your legs, every once in a while, roll the tick roller and with the sticky side exposed, of course, and you're gonna find that you're picking up, you know, loose ticks before they bite you. Which is why you see these big Hulk Hogan guys leaving Walmart or the hardware store and they're carrying these lint rollers. Like Hulk Hogan, what are you doing with a lint roller? Like, oh, well, I'm a landscaper. I'm going to make sure uh, that I don't get ticks on me, right? So I've definitely seen that that really works. So this is the newest visitor in town. This is what Eastern Long Island wants you to remember, right? So it's been around now for about five years or so, what we call the Asian longhorn tick. And was actually discovered that about one in 250 ticks actually carries Lyme disease. Uh, and in entomology, the Entomological Society of America have been collecting Asian longhorns, and they just recently published that about one in 250 are actually carrying Lyme. So if any of you happen to see this Asian longhorn, we want to study it, right? Let us know at the tick center. We sent it to the county health department. So what are the ticks that are out there? Well, again, it's deer tick season right now, right? It's deer tick season. And right now, the nymphs, which are the teenagers, are really out May to August. The deer tick nymph carries uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Lyme. It also carries Babesia, which is a parasite. 
anaplasma and this Powassan or flavivirus, which is the deer tick virus. Now, so you get a, a deer tick on you, that's where we would consider giving you a preventative medicine if we catch it early enough. Now, remember the larva are these little six-legged guys. They're almost clear. They really start becoming active July, August, September. This is where those lint rollers uh, definitely um, come into play. So um, when we think about the deer tick, right? When we think about the deer tick, we've got the larva, we've got the nymph, and now we have the adult, in particular, the female. I'm seeing a few adult deer tick bites out there, but look at this, according to tickencounter.org. We're seeing a lot of them, right? The larvae are born, they become teenagers, they become adults. So we're seeing, you know, deer tick bites November, December. They carry those same germs, you know, Lyme, Babesia, Anaplasma, and Powassan virus. Powassan is a very short transmission time. Some of these ticks are so small, you might never even see the tick that got you. Look at this publication from 2019. A minority of kids diagnosed with Lyme recall seeing a tick bite. So it could be in the back of your hair, behind your knee. You may never see the tick that got you. The next tick is the dog tick. It kind of has that distinctive pattern um, on its back. Now, dog ticks really don't have Lyme. So if someone gets a dog tick bite, we're really not giving them um, a prophylactic, which is why when you get bitten by a tick, we really want you to use those tick center fine tip forceps and pull that tick off straight out 90 degrees, save the tick and label it. Now, a lot of people call the dog tick the rickettsial or rocky mounted spotted tick because uh, it can carry um, rocky mounted spotted fever, rickettsia, and even sometimes tularemia, right? Which is why when a patient calls me and they say, I have a tick bite, my first question is, can you bring the tick in? I want to know the type, whether it's larval, whether it's nymphal. Um, so that gives us an idea of what to do about it. Also in our tick guidebook and in our tick kit, we give you this really amazing um, tick ID card and it's got pictures on there. It kind of gives you an idea of the main ones um, in our area. What about the Lone Star tick? What about the Lone Star tick, right? The Lone Star, what we really worry about is the alpha gal meat allergy, right? So if someone says, Jerry, I got a Lone Star tick bite, people will know by the big white dot of the female Lone Star or kind of the clearest outer shell of the adult male. Even though you don't wanna hear it, I tell people, my personal advice is don't eat meat for a month. Because if you do get the alpha gal allergy, if you eat a meat, you're gonna trigger that allergy. But my hot headed theory is if you don't introduce the allergen, then that alpha gal may never take hold. So far, a lot of patients have said that they don't eat meat for a month, they're not developing alpha gal. I have them written on post-it notes. I really should put it together and make it into um, a formal study for sure. So don't eat meat after for a month after a Lone Star tick bite. Now, when someone does get um, either a nymphal or a Lone Star adult female, we still worry about Ehrlichia, which again is another like dramatic flu-like kind of presentation. Tularemia, which is related to like cat scratch fever. We can also see uh, these two bacteria transmitted as well. Look, right now we're in Lone Star Nymphal season, right? And adult female. As I said, we're seeing deer ticks and we're starting to see more Lone Star ticks right now. 
August to September is where you really get those little baby ticks, especially the Lone Star tick. And you don't want to be that person that steps into a nest of Lone Star ticks. You might find um, that your toe is covered, you know, with dozens or even hundreds of these baby ticks. Now, most of you have heard it that there are no documented chiggers on Long Island. It's true, write that down. What you're actually seeing Labor Day weekend when you think you've got chiggers is you actually have these little baby baby, these little larval um, tick bites from the Lone Star tick. Those are the main kinds of ticks that we're really dealing with right now. And remember, I said that the tick lives for two years, right? It lives for two years. And typically, you know, the mom is going to lay eggs. Sometimes one tick can lay like a thousand eggs. It's disgusting to look at, right? Those eggs, and that's typically going to be laid in the spring. Those eggs are going to grow up into the summer into larvae, right? So if you get rid of the places where ticks live, like uh, leaf piles and long brush, hopefully you're going to prevent the eggs from even being um, placed. Now the larvae needs to grow up and the larvae needs food. It's a baby. It needs to eat. So it's going to look for a mouse, a bird, a chipmunk uh, for its first meal. So if you get rid of mouse havens, wood piles, um, you know, old debris in your yard, uh, leaf piles, things like that, you're going to get rid of mouse and chipmunks. This is also time to put those little tick tubes, those permethrin like toilet paper tubes around your yard. Mice and chipmunks will grab those for the nest. They bring it back and that helps to kill the ticks on them. Also, anybody that's been to a Jerry lecture knows that I am not a fan of bird baths and bird feeders because you're actively attracting birds into your yard. And we know that birds can carry ticks. So when they're there feeding, they're dropping the ticks in your yard. Any bird food that drops is going to attract squirrels, mice, and chipmunks. And those are now bringing more ticks into your yard. People, listen to me. When this lecture is over, get rid of your bird bath, get rid of your bird feeder. Even though we love looking at the birds, I really don't want you attracting things that are bringing ticks into your yard. Now, through summer, once the larva has its first meal, the larva is going to molt then into the nymphal stage. It's going to go from a baby to a teenager. And all of you know that those teenagers um, are either hungry or sleeping, right? A teenager is either hungry or sleeping, right? So it's going to molt basically into the nymph. Fall and winter, it's asleep, right? And then spring into summer, the nymph is now looking for its second meal. It could be you, a mouse, a dog, a deer, horse, anything along those lines, right? It wants that second meal. And then it's going to molt into an adult and it's going to go looking for its third meal, person, deer, dog, things like that. And then it's going to go through its life cycle and it's the female will lay its eggs. So as you can see, there are lots of opportunities for you to break this cycle by simply changing the habitat around your house. We also know, for example, that a three foot wood chip border around your yard, ticks that are crawling are not going to crawl over a three foot wood chip border. So that's another great one, keeping your grass really short, right? Even though it might burn, long grass is going to attract ticks. And remember that ticks love moisture. So after it rains, the ticks will literally climb to the top of the, of the blade of grass 
start questing and looking for a meal. Dry weather, the ticks go in. Wet weather, the ticks come out. And we'll talk more about prevention towards the end. So how do we diagnose Lyme disease? That's why a lot of you are here wondering, how do you know if you've got Lyme? Well, the CDC recommends that we diagnose Lyme disease based on their signs and symptoms, your complaints and what we find on physical exam. Number two, the likelihood that a patient's been exposed to a black-legged tick, right? If you're an Alaskan fisherman, your chance of getting bitten by a tick is a lot less than if you're a Long Island outdoors person. Also thinking about other possible illnesses. Have you been checked for COVID, rheumatoid, things like that? And results of lab work when indicated. So people, people that know me know I, I don't really get upset very often. But when the CDC is running around saying that Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, that kind of upsets me because I want them to know that it's more than one germ that causes that. And when doctors and PAs are running around saying, Jerry, they don't have Lyme disease, the blood test is negative. I'm like, well, the CDC doesn't say that you have to have a positive blood test. Of course, just having the rash is diagnostic enough. And it might take a few days for that central clearing, right? For example, this is an early Lyme rash. It hasn't had a chance to really have a central clearing. So it's very important that all rashes in the summer, we at least think about Lyme, especially if it's around the groin, the armpit, the legs where ticks like to live. According to the CDC, there are three stages of Lyme. The early phase, including the rash, and that can go on for months. Early neurologic, including Bell's palsy and headache and numbness and tingling. And then late, including other neurologic issues, can even go on for years. So when Stony Brook and Stanford publish that Lyme the disease can persist. I mean, that's exactly what we're seeing in the data. So here's the official CDC worksheet of symptoms. Fever, chills, headache, fatigue. It sounds like it could be anything, right? And possibility of having a rash, right? And look at this. The CDC says, Fever and other symptoms can occur in the absence of a rash. So not everybody's gonna have that erythema rash. A small bump or redness could be a little localized tick reaction. And there's another disease called STARI, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, where you get a rash that kind of looks like an erythema migrans, but it's not actually an infection. So STARI looks enough like Lyme that we're usually treating people with antibiotic anyway. Later symptoms of Lyme, according to the CDC, could be severe headaches and neck stiffness, other rashes coming later, arthritis with joint pain, facial palsy, intermittent pain in the tendons, muscles, and bones, pain that comes and goes heart palpitations and dizziness, nerve pain. So Lyme could be a lot of different things. If someone says, Jerry, my knee hurts, it must be Lyme disease. I'm like, hmm, probably not. But if they're like, my jaw hurts, then my shoulder hurts, then my wrist hurts, then my knee hurts. I'm like, okay, you have traveling joint pain. That sounds a lot more like Lyme. So this is the medical book almost all doctors and PAs use in training called Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. Most every medical person has seen this book. They actually have a really amazing section on Lyme disease. And not to get too technical on you, but look what they published. They published that the most remarkable aspect of Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme genome, is that there are sequences for more than a hundred different 
types of proteins more than any other organism. So they're saying that the Lyme disease germ can be incredibly complex, and there are multiple types of Lyme disease. In fact, everybody, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Everybody want to hear a story? Well, I'm going to say it anyway, even if you don't want to hear a story. I had a patient come, and they had headache and swollen joints and flu-like, and they were a landscaper. So I'm like, wow, you have a new onset headache, flu-like joint pain, sounds like Lyme. I'm going to give you doxycycline. And they come back about two weeks later. They're like, Jerry, what are you doing to me? I don't feel good. In fact, I'm just getting even more and more symptoms. So I thought of the Harrison's book, and it said there are multiple kinds of Lyme disease. So I'm like, why don't you stop doxycycline and try taking a different antibiotic, amoxicillin? And you know what, people? Boom. Within three days, they started really feeling amazing because my message to you is there are different kinds of Lyme. If one medicine isn't working, very often you have to try a different kind. This is really Rebecca's specialty of helping you tease out what you've done and what you have to do next. Look at this. The spirochete has few proteins and depends on its host for much of its nutrition. So when you're taking a lot of vitamins and minerals, sometimes you're just feeding the Lyme germ. And I've got a slide on that coming up. Now, another thing to remember is there are different kinds of germs that the ticks carry. Poisson virus, tularemia, ehrlichia, anaplasma, we talked about those, Rocky Mounted, Colorado tick fever, all of these things could be in a tick, right? Babesia, as we said, is very common and the deer tick can transmit that. If you go to the CDC website right now, they say that Babesia has a one to nine week incubation period. So you might get bitten by a tick at Halloween and not have symptoms until December because of this incubation period. Babesia kind of looks like malaria, like you were bitten by a mosquito and you've gotten malaria. Hot sweats and fever, shortness of breath. And I've had people that come in and they look like in December, like they've been on an African safari where they got malaria. And I see that they're an active gardener and it looks like they probably had a tick on them. So look at this. This is the distribution of all the different kinds of tick germs, right? Definitely in the Dakotas all the way down, we've got a lot of like tularemia, right? Up in the Northeast, we've kind of got overlapping dots, uh, Lyme disease, anaplasma, a lot of Babesia, and tick-borne relapsing fever, which is related to Borrelia miyamotai, which is a different kind of Borrelia. Luckily, Borrelia miyamotai, which is a different type of Lyme, also responds to um, doxycycline. Look at this article, Borrelia miyamotai, a relapsing fever in Ixodes ticks. And this tick can also carry encephalitis, anaplasma, ehrlichia, and babesia, all in one tick. We don't see it a lot, but we do see it enough that more than one, that one tick will give you more than one disease. So how did the ticks actually get infected? Tinkerbell doesn't come down with her magic wand and give all these ticks their disease, right? The ticks get a germ by biting or feeding on an animal that also has Lyme, like a bird or a mouse or a chipmunk or anything like that, even us. And then they pass that infection on to other animals, which is why reducing deer exposure, whether it's a four poster system or population control, really is critical. In our neighborhood, the deer is one of the big vectors. The white footed mouse, birds, chipmunks, squirrels, you know, even though everybody loves to sit down and watch Snow White, and Snow White always has all those little critters 
sitting around her, right? All the little woodland Disney creatures sitting around her. I always cringe and I tell my kids, that's not normal. Snow White's gonna get Lyme disease, right? So you want all of these guys out of your yard. And then the ticks, they get the germ from a mouse or a chipmunk, and then they can pass that germ on to us, people, pets, and animals, right? So a couple of interesting facts. We know that patients with early disease who are recognized and treated generally do very well, right? Patients with late disease can have these multiple organ systems, which we've talked about. And we now have had Lyme disease reported in all 50 states. Is that because birds are moving it around, because ticks are spreading like we saw in the chart, or you're vacationing in Mattituck, you get a tick on you, you fly home to Alaska, and then they report it there. So we're gonna talk about Lyme testing, and then we'll talk about prevention as we wrap up our hour here. So one of the most common tests is called the ELISA test. It's like the general Lyme disease screening. But there are multiple studies that show the ELISA is about 65% sensitive. So when you're getting a Lyme disease test, we'll usually combine it with what's called a Western blot to help us look for accuracy. Western blot, we look at it two different ways. Immunoglobulin M, like Mary, which looks for active infection, and immunoglobulin G, like George, or gone, which is a marker for old infection. So the ELISA and the Western blot is what we commonly call a two-tier testing. And it looks at different kilodalton weights of proteins and we read this numerical code to kind of give us an idea of what's going on with the body. IgM, the active marker, usually rises over a month, which is why if you're newly sick, you might not have a positive test, right? And it'll peak in about six or eight weeks. IgG is typically elevated in two to eight weeks, and remains elevated while the infection is present. So this is an example of IgM and IgG, and looking at these numerical codes gives us an idea as to what's going on with you. Very important, according to the CDC, some people who get antibiotics early in the disease may not develop antibodies, and then the Western blot doesn't work. Another reason why the CDC says that um, a positive test is not required, right? And again, it takes antibodies time to develop. Also, Eastern Long Island and Southampton, if you come in with an acute flu-like illness and you're COVID negative, we're gonna do a panel to look for all the different tick germs like Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, and Ehrlichia. And we know that if you get a tick that gives you more than one germ, it's gonna very often have a harder time for you getting rid of the Lyme disease. And here's just an example of a titer of a Western blot and titers where we look for Babesia, Bartonella, and Lyme. Treatment typically for Lyme disease is 21 to 30 days. And some people, if you remember my story, might need a repeated course. And sometimes as the Lyme disease germ is being killed, you might actually feel a little worse before you feel better. That's something called a Herxheimer reaction. And doxycycline luckily works for almost all the tick germs we were talking about today. Alpha-gal, there's a blood test to tell us what alpha-gal is. And very often alpha-gal can affect the gut microbiome by depleting immunoglobulin A like apple. And sometimes that's a secondary marker to tell us what's going on with alpha-gal. This is an interesting study where they found that the Lyme disease germ actually eats zinc, and manganese, 
um, and even um, copper and magnesium. And this article said, if you're trying to treat Lyme disease, stop giving the minerals that actually feed the germ. So that's a really interesting idea. Also, Johns Hopkins published a study that certain essential oils like oregano and cinnamon actually can be a possible effective treatment for Lyme disease. So the big names people, Johns Hopkins, Stanford are publishing really great info on both diagnosis, treatment, management of Lyme. So as we wrap up our hour, I definitely want to leave you with advice on prevention. I'll just keep saying it. Get rid of mice, squirrels, chipmunks, and birds. You don't want them in your yard. Reduce deer exposure, deer fencing. Push for four poster systems um, in your community. Protect yourself and check yourself regularly, right? A great tip is ticks hate the scent of lavender. Use lavender soap, detergent, shampoo. Put dryer sheets, lavender scented in your kid's pocket. Very important to protect yourself with two layers. Protect your skin and clothing. DEET is probably the most um, famous one. Like everybody has seen uh, Deep Woods Off and similar products. Uh, which can go on your skin. Um, one of my favorites is permethrin, which goes on clothing, shoes and socks, clothing. If you have clothing with permethrin on it and the tick crawls on it, you'll literally see like the tick curl up and die. Pretty amazing, right? And um, like I said, I like people to pull their socks over their pants. Putting some duct tape sticky side out will capture any ticks that maybe your lint roller will miss. We already said to put your clothing in the dryer. If you wash your clothing, the water is just feeding the ticks. Get rid of those baby mice, right? All mice, look at the ticks all over this guy's ears, right? Avoid tall grasses, stay in the center of the path. If you even want to go hiking at all, be careful out there, right? And again, around your yard, use a three foot wood chip border all around your property to keep ticks off, right? Avoid deer tick bites, right? Wear light colored clothing, walk in the center of a trail. People, July, August, even though it's fun to be out there, this kind of looks scary to me, right? Remember, ticks don't fly, they don't jump, they hang out on a blade of grass waiting for you to brush by and then they grab you, right? And again, prevention is so critical because you might never see the tick that got you. The first Sunday of every month at the Simon's house, we're spraying all of our shoes, even our flip-flops with permethrin and it works all month and it helps to get rid of those ticks. Now, I have two teens. I don't necessarily want them spreading DEET on themselves every single day. So the Environmental Working Group, um, which is an environmental group I've worked with, actually has done studies which show that oil of lemon eucalyptus is very effective. So I like to use oil of lemon eucalyptus on the skin and then permethrin um, on clothing, for exa example. That's a good two-layered approach. If you've got your cameras on your phone, this is the slide you wanna take a picture of. Let me see you taking pictures of this slide. Studies show that, um, of course, deep woods off, like DEET, is very effective, but cutter lemon eucalyptus also is even more effective after four hours, right? So DEET and eucalyptus are some of the big winners out there. Prevention, right, two layered approach. Here's a guy that did that sticky side of the tape outwards. And imagine if all of those ticks 
got up there, right? That could be a problem. Check your dogs or cats, talk to your vet about different types of um, preventive collars. Please people, don't let your dogs sleep with you at night in the bed. That's when they're gonna drop all the ticks off, okay? There's a Lyme disease vaccine for dogs, but again, it doesn't prevent them from bringing the ticks in. If you get a tick on you, you're going to grab your Southampton kit and you're gonna get those very fine point tweezers and you're gonna pull the tick perpendicular 90 degrees out of the skin, right? Clean the area with alcohol or iodine, save the tick for inspection. There are several places like University of Massachusetts that has an excellent testing lab. Um, but again, it is expensive. Uh, Rebecca, what are your opinions on testing for ticks? Well, I think testing takes good for, you know, it's a public service to get statistics, but I think for the person themselves, if the tick's positive, that doesn't necessarily mean they're positive. So they're still going to have to follow the same protocol. So if it yeah. is expensive. I mean, it's just something to remember. And we don't know if the tick's negative, as you have said before, if they were tick was on you for a long time, maybe a lot of the bacteria went into the person and then they pull the tick off and then they test the tick and the tick is negative. So I just don't think they should put a lot of store in what the results are, though no doctors used to do that. They would treat patients according to what the tick test said, but they're not doing that as far as I can see, they're not doing that so much anymore. Yeah. You have to follow your protocol regardless of what the tick test says. Exactly. Right. So again, if the tick is negative, does that mean if the tick has been on you that all the germs are inside? If the tick is positive, does that mean that you haven't gotten any? Now, one thing to think about is a tick bite reaction, your local reaction to the tick compared to an erythema migrans. The Lyme rash can take up to a month to occur, but a tick bite reaction will occur in hours. The Lyme rash is very rarely itchy, but a tick bite reaction is. And any of you that have been bitten by a tick, you know that reaction, that itchy reaction can drive you crazy. And I found a little bit of iodine solution over the tick will get rid of that itch very efficiently. Remember the only way for us to reduce ticks is for everybody to work together. You and your family preventing bites, uh, government setting policy and providing funding, um, healthcare providers raising awareness and educating people, continuing to do studies, passing laws. Uh, Karen actually sent an article this morning about one of our senators pushing for more um, Lyme disease testing. So everybody, you made it. We're a little bit over our hour, but we're gonna go through our true and false. We wanna see how you did on our Eastern Long Island quiz show today. So number one, ticks can only make you sick if they're attached for more than 24 hours. We know that's false. Lyme is the only serious tick illness. We know that's false. Alpha-gal meat allergy can be deadly. That's absolutely true. If you get a severe anaphylactic reaction, that affects your breathing. Everyone with Lyme remembers a tick bite. We know that that's absolutely false. Uh, the CDC says a positive Lyme test is required to diagnose Lyme. We know that's false. A tick can give you more than one illness, absolutely true. And remember, they can give you more than one kind of Lyme. A summer flu could be a tick problem, absolutely. You can only get a tick bite in warm weather, that's false. And most everybody with Lyme disease gets over it, that's true, but not everybody gets over it. So Eastern Long Island Hospital, we set this all up. Please support um, our center, if you can. Um, Karen Wolfrat's email is here. You have Rebecca Young's um, phone number. You have my email um, here also as well. Um, so Rebecca and Karen, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts before we look at the Q and A. I 
I think you did a very good job, Jerry. <laughs> Great. Let's look at some of the questions that came in. So, um, so yes, will you be getting these slides? Yes, everything is um, recorded. And I'm going to check with Karen about um, how to make sure you get access. So guess what? You can listen to me and Rebecca over and over and over again. So somebody asked, I was bitten by a deer tick many years ago, and you get redness and swelling. Guess what? Sometimes I've seen that there's a little microscopic piece of the tick that's still in there. And we will take a punch biopsy, kind of like if we're evaluating a mole. And if you can pinpoint that exact area, we will do a little scraping of the skin, not a big procedure. It's done in about 40 seconds in an office procedure. And boom, we cure people's chronic um, tick bite uh, itch. And a couple other questions. Do you think medical professionals are more aware? Um, yes, I think that especially in our neighborhood, that more and more people are becoming cognizant of what's going on. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, I mentioned that famous people are starting to push for greater Lyme disease awareness, right? That the hospital is funding this center and a phone number, funding Rebecca's position to help with this. So yeah, there are good things um, that are happening. Another question of the different bands, are any becoming more common? My personal um, experience is I've seen a lot more neurologic disease like Bell's palsy um, and numbness and tingling. And um, yes, treatment for a tick bite. People, that's a whole nother conversation, very controversial. There's a study that shows after a tick bite that two doxycycline can prevent an erythema migrans rash, but it doesn't necessarily study preventing Lyme disease specifically. So um, I tend to be a little bit more aggressive, potentially giving a longer course of medicine based on the patient's condition, type of tick, um, things like that. We have all of your emails. We'll be able to send you a link when these um, slides and the video are posted. Um, I know, of course, as usual, people that know me know I'm a little bit over my time. Um, but again, hopefully you've gotten some good prevention tips, some interesting facts to talk about at your next um, party. And again, from Eastern Long Island Hospital, Stony Brook ELIH and Stony Brook Southampton and our regional tick center, uh, we all want to thank you for spending an hour or so with us this afternoon. Have a good rest of your day and remember to use tick spray. Thanks all. Thank you, Jerry. Great.